Welcome everyone to the 17th of hopefully many DGenesis lore drop videos. Today we are starting with part 2 of our little series on the Vasco Wretched Hag Tsar Petrova Complex, as I call it. First of all, thanks to all the new subscribers and also the old subscribers. We have reached, I think, 412 subscribers. That means we are only 8 subscribers away from my life goal of reaching the second and final funny number. So please do subscribe if you haven't already. And please, please, please also check out the Echoes of Eschaton podcast. Coop the DM has finally released the last episode of this season and it is amazing. So if you want more DGenesis content, Coop's podcast probably is the best thing out there. And now, enjoy this video. The Wretched Hag, also known as the Lady in Black, is a mythological figure in the region of Pollen. She has become somewhat of a Jungian archetype, haunting the collective unconscious of the Polliners. She is a witch, maybe an evolution of the figure of Baba Yaga. Her eyes and teeth are black, her skin a web of scars. For centuries, she's been haunting the Polliner's legends. The Lady in Black, lurking in the ruins, her screams making your marrow freeze. The Ancient One is supposed to be immortal, crazy, and diseased, full of insatiable hunger, damned to exist until the end of days, to finally judge the traitors who left her in the ruins. Pollen's clans know her well, telling their children stories of her before bedtime. The wretched hag comes to get unruly children, haunts their dreams, and eats the naughty. If you don't get to sleep, she'll come and gobble you up. Almost no other legend is as well known among Pollen's clans as the tale of the Lady in Black. The first recordings date back to a few years after the Eschaton. Crude murals beyond Poznan's deserted sea of debris. What could have frightened the Polliners that much that it burned this tale into their collective unconscious? There is a figure in the world of Degenesis that shares some features with the wretched hag, the mysterious Mother of Ravens. The Mother of Ravens is the leader of the Carrion Birds, an apocalyptic flock that came fluttering into Justition right after the judges had founded the Protectorate. The Carrion Birds have their fingers deep in Justition's economy, they own the hottest bordellos. Their champions are amongst the best pit fighters. Their storks buy the children of poor scrappers or farmers at dawn, teach them to pick pockets and to perform evasive maneuvers. Smuggling, slavery, assassinations. The carrion birds are in. They have always been led by a raven, or more accurately, the mother of ravens. Since the era of the beast, a person of that name was the talk of the town. With her claws, she tore enemies' throats out full of anger. She was there when Exalt fell, took part in the city wars and in Coltrane's march. Generations of lovers became caught in her web and died after making love to her. She birthed whole tribes in the east, ravens in the Balkan, in Pollen, and in Borka have her blood in their veins. The incapable ones amongst her children she killed in their sleep, cooking and eating them, so they returned to her womb food for the next spawn 
already making her belly swell. But that was centuries ago. The mother of ravens, nesting amidst her flock like a haggard demon, nowadays simply has to be someone else. Yet the legend claims otherwise. Considering the title of this video, it should come as no surprise that the wretched hag and the mother of ravens are in fact the same person. We have a pretty clear picture of who the wretched hag or the mother of ravens was before the Eschaton. Like so many of the major players of the Degenesis metaplot, she can be found on the picture showing the members of the recombination group's board. It is the woman known as Y, her real name being Irina Belova. We know that Irina was a lover of Jerome Gattrell, and that through him she gained more and more influence. Eventually, she became the leader of the apocalyptic sect, a prototype of the cult of apocalyptics, who followed Gattrell's teachings and his tarot before the Eschaton. The sect was also responsible for an array of terror attacks, of which one was aimed at the laboratories of Nathan Argyre in London. Irina appeared as the mother of ravens, orchestrating the attacks probably ordered by Gattrell. This at least seems to be the case in respect to the London attack, which led to Nathan Argyre joining the recombination group after he had first refused due to ethical concerns. Jerome Gattrell disappeared before the Eschaton, leaving Irina and the apocalyptic sect to fend for themselves. Irina felt betrayed and gave testament to her resentment and anger in a letter addressed to Gattrell, which can be found in the first Degenesis book, Primal Punk. The letter goes as follows. Gatrell, I dabbled in black magic, sorcery, and all the vices a mimetic brain can imagine, and dove into the darkness you wanted to see summoned. I found nothing. Our end is nigh. Your prophecies were all true, but you left us here as carrion for the gods. Your cast still echo throughout the static stream. Your followers are in arms, desperately awaiting your return. Everything is changing. Destruction is the motor, as you always claimed. The night sky is now bright as day. The stars have come to seal our fates. I drink the blood of ravens, and I eat the bowels of birds, in anticipation of this final judgment. I know that you have fled from us, so I write these final words in full knowledge that they won't survive the time, the fire, and the killing that will have to pass until your return. But know this, Gatrell. Know that my hatred for you will survive. Know that I will copulate with the armies of survivors. Know that I will take the semen of every man alive and hatch children of hate. And these children, that will spring forth from my bowels, will grow, and come to bear more children, and my family will grow. And every newborn will be nourished with the milk of my hatred. And this family will become an army, that will survive the time. They will hunt you, turning over every rock on this planet in search for you. There will be no place left to hide from my revenge. 
I spit on your nanite infested bones. Yours, why? In this letter, written on November 22, 2072, only a few months before the Eschaton, we learn several things about the woman who would become the wretched hag. Irina seems to have been on a quest, dabbling in black magic and sorcery, which Gatrell might have sent her on with his esoteric philosophy and his tarot. Yet all this led to nothing. Gatrell has disappeared, his followers are in disarray, and Irina has sworn revenge. She clearly states her plan of giving birth to an army that will hunt down and destroy Gatrell and everything he has built. The letter's last sentence, I spit on your nanite infested bones also hints at the fact that Irina seems to have an aversion towards the nanite treatment that was supposed to offer near immortality to the recombination board members and the sleepers of Project Tannhäuser and Project Free Spirit. This letter turned out to be a prophetic document outlining exactly what Irina would become after the Eschaton. Looking at Irina's story after the Eschaton, we have to look into the two aspects of her persona. On the one hand, she became the wretched hag, the mythological figure mainly known in Pollen, where murals and bedtime stories kept her mythos alive. It seems plausible that Irina used her skills in memetics, which she might have learned from Gatrell to build and control the apocalyptic sect before the Eschaton to spread the mythos of the wretched hag across Pollen. It is also plausible that she started her campaign of growing a family of hatred against Gatrell at this point, birthing children with the survivors in Pollen, gaining more and more influence with every child. In my last video about Dr. Ernest Vasco, I talked about the peculiar fact that the superorganism growing underneath pollen, known as the Tsar, considers the wretched hag to be its mother, and that it sent out iterations of Vasco in search of her. There are two readings of this peculiar fact that I want to present here. The first one came from a lovely commenter and fellow Degenesis Metaplot connoisseur, Kama Raimo, who suspects that one of Irina's children might have been consumed by the Tsar, who has thus integrated the child's memories. Another possibility would be that Irina just gave birth to a biokinetic that eventually became the Tsar. Another idea that I had was that Irena managed to imprint herself into the collective unconscious of the Polliners in the form of the wretched hag so much that the Tsar, who in a way is a manifestation of the unconscious forces of Pollen, believes her to be its mother, since she is the archetypal Ur mother of the region. Maybe some more light will be shed on this complex in my next video on the Tsar specifically. We know that after the Eschaton, Irina began her campaign of imprinting herself into the minds of the Polliners. The first entry in the history of the Protectorate section of the Righteous Fist book speaks of the wretched hag seeping into the collective unconscious of the surviving Polliners 
and becoming the symbol of their worst fears in the year 2100. Irina traveled to Borka, where she settled down in Justician in 2483 to command Europe's most powerful flock of apocalyptics, the carrion birds. What she did during the more than 400 years between the Eschaton and her arrival in Justician is only vaguely described. It is said that she gave birth to countless powerful ravens across the Balkan, Pollen and Borka, to immortalize her legacy. Yet we know that she played an important part in an event that changed the tides of the city wars and the history of the Protectorate. The Warlord Cultron a champion of Gatrell's Free Spirit Project, who led the Exaltian armies across the Protectorate, sacking city after city, was attacked by Arena at the height of his power. She used her mimetic expertise on Gatrell's champion and turned him into her mimetic slave. Coltrane became a mind-controlled murderer, known as the Het Collector, who hunted down and killed nearly all scrappers that reached Exalt and the Grindworks. Irina wanted to make sure that Gatrell's Grindworks would never activate again, effectively crushing every hope of Project Free Spirit ever gaining momentum again after the City Wars. For more information on Exalt, Cultron, and the City Wars, do check out my Project Free Spirit video. Looking at her long legacy and the fact that Irina most probably never received the Nanai treatment, which is basically confirmed by her stats block in the book Moloch, begs the question how she survived so long. The answer to this question can be found in another character mentioned in Moloch. Joshua the Butcher is a biokinetic that was birthed by the Mother of Ravens a lifetime ago, and he has kept his mother alive, being controlled by her memetics. It is plausible that Irina gave birth to biokinetics before, and that she used her biokinetic children to keep herself alive over the centuries. With his powers of body modification and life transfusion, Joshua has not only expanded his mother's lifespan, but has also healed hundreds of his brothers and sisters, ravens of the apocalyptics, injured in fights, Joshua bides his time inside the bowels of Justician, where the true nest of the carrion birds lies. The lair of the Mother of Ravens is located in a bygone sewer network. It's a crude and sprawling dungeon. Primitive glyph paintings adorn the walls. Large areas are covered in carpets of mushrooms and lichen. Many canals crisscross this soggy domain. Carrion birds arrive at this place to receive their mother's instruction or bring her gifts. They navigate the damned realm on small canoes to get across the flooded sections. Nobody would be crazy enough to swim through the toxic soup. The light sources illuminating the waterways are sparse and gloomy, consisting of ancient mining lanterns hanging off the walls or torches barely exposing some narrow gateway. Only the Mother of Ravens knows the true extent of the nest, and only those that have earned the hag's trust are allowed to enter. But it's not just apocalyptics, who are admitted to address her. Throughout history, 
The Mother of Ravens has received many guests from different cults, Anabaptists and chroniclers alike. And some, like the Baptist Amos, the leader of Basham, or the Fragment Impulse, became recurring visitors. The Lair belongs to the Mother of Ravens alone, and is her private refuge, only accessible by stepping into a rusty cage and being lowered down a shaft via a pulley system. The cage goes down a hole that measures 20 paces in diameter and drops off 30 meters into murky twilight. The base of the shaft is the center of the lair, where the mother receives her visitors. Yet only her family members are permitted to venture further. Several man-sized concrete tunnels branch off into side sections, connecting to other parts of the structure via ladders and handrails. What lies beyond is forbidden to anyone who is not of her blood. In the carrion bird's nest, only selected few meet Joshua, the butcher, and son to the mother of ravens. Accessible via a hidden elevator, Joshua's hideout, dubbed the laboratory, features organic walls pulsating with red arteries. Illuminated by dim light, it reveals a gruesome interior filled with mason jars containing a blue liquid known as firefly, made from biokinetic blood. Human faces adorn some of the jars, remnants of those condemned to death by the mother of ravens. The victims' bodies are repurposed for carrion bird use. With organs transplanted into wounded, bones fashioned into weapons, and flesh skinned for masks. This is Joshua's realm. He bides his time here, restricted from shape-shifting by occult measures and memetics, condemned to dull tasks of butchery. Deep within, he retreats to a private section to recover and, upon his mother's demand, rejuvenates her within a cocoon-like structure that he controls. In close vicinity to Joshua's prison lies the so-called bird cage. Those who defy the word of the mother of ravens may end up here, Inside the birdcage, a spacious underground prison where traitors are held and tortured until their resistance is broken entirely. And finally there is the tribute chamber. The mother of Raven demands gifts and tributes from her visitors, yet her preferences remain unpredictable. Whether trinkets or powerful artifacts, she fancies the mundane as much as the extraordinary. Some suspect she cares little for gifts, using the ritual only to unsettle her visitors. Her tribute chamber houses a vast array of gifts and remains forbidden even to her sons, sparking speculation of hidden treasures amongst those who know of it. Legend has it that the tribute chamber is illuminated by an image wall of bygone design and that the hag disappears in here to speak to someone who is at least as timeless as herself.
one of the most important short stories of the Degenesis metaplot connected to the Mother of Ravens concerns the gift. In the short story, titled The Gift, the high-ranking chronicler Impulse visits the Mother of Ravens and presents her with an item crucial to many narrative strains of the metaplot. The object in Impulse's possession is known as the Fjolger. It is a small atomic reactor, the size of a palm, which many factions of the metaplot search for in order to obtain their various goals. In the story, Impulse tries to hide the Fjolger by giving it to the Mother of Ravens, but she refuses and thus curses him to take care of the item himself. For more information on the Fjolger, check out my video on the Needle Tower disaster. As mentioned before, the Chronicler Fragment Impulse was not the only one who has visited the Mother of Ravens, asking for her guidance and help. Another prominent member of another cult is the Anabaptist Amos, a hero of the war against the Primer and the leader of the city of Bassam. He did use his connection to the Mother of Ravens and the prophetic foresights of her tarot to gain power within his cult. She foretold the birth of the Pharomancer King Marcuron and Amos's victory over him. However, the crone gave him a warning. His ascension and transformation into an avatar of Rebus would not be without obstacles. A child would spring forth from an unholy union between a chronicler and an Anabaptist and tear at the fabric of creation, the mother of ravens whispered. The newborn would be the obverse of every one of Amos's accomplishments and defile the cult's tenets, destroying the Anabaptists at their foundation. Therefore it had to be found and killed before it was too late. Amos spent years searching for the child without finding a single trace. He visited the hag once more, begging her to reveal the truth to him. The mother of ravens grinned at the Baptist, writhing before her, asking him how he could be sure that Marcuron was truly dead. Amos froze at the thought. He had seen the cadaver with his own eyes and witnessed the ziggurat crumbling before him. How could the pharaomancer king not be dead? The hag dismissed Amos with a snarl, reminding him of the fact that fate was malleable like clay and that he'd have a second chance at fulfilling his prophecy. Enraged by the riddles of the Mother of Ravens, the Baptist stormed out of her lair and cut all ties with the crone. Yet he cannot shake off her spell. The revelation of the child that will come to oppose him at the zenith of power gnaws at him day after day. Amos must know. Even though the Mother of Ravens is the undisputed leader of the Carrion Birds and is much revered by apocalyptic flocks all over Europe, at the heart of the Carrion Birds' territory a flock of pirates has established their nest and seized the Flotsam, Justician's largest casino and brothel. The Dust Riders are composed of Pergan apocalyptics who have openly renounced the traditions of the Mother of Ravens. Through underhanded treachery, they were able to drive a devastating blow into the Carrion Birds' flank 
shaking the flock to its core, yet remaining unpunished to this day. The Dust Riders do not fear retribution. They have cemented their claim to power and now hold all of the cards. Only future releases of D Genesis might tell us what the Dust Riders are up to. At the end of this video, I want to at least mention a peculiar fact that concerns the Mother of Raven's role in the Jackal's Prophecy, which will be the topic of a future video. The Jackal's Prophecy is a poetic text that starts off the first D Genesis book, Primal Punk, and has been confirmed to contain the entire metaplot of D Genesis in a nutshell. The prophecy mentions four so-called masters of immortality, and Irina has been confirmed as one of them. Who the others might be is a question I will tackle in the Jekyll's Prophecy video that will probably come out at some point. To conclude, the origin of the Wretched Hag and the Mother of Ravens can be found close to the recombination group. Irina Belova, Jerome Gattrell's lover and leader of the apocalyptic sect, rose to power after the Eschaton, implanting herself into the collective unconscious of the Polliners, given birth to countless ravens, growing an army of vengeance she would use to crush the golds of the man who betrayed her. With her schemes and premonitions, she has left a mark not only on the landscape of Justitian, but on the Degenesis metaplot as a whole. Alright everyone, thank you for watching this video, and thanks a lot to Muinmos for her great performance of Irina. I think she did an outstanding job, and she has done many outstanding jobs playing Pseudo on Echoes of Eschaton, um, which I recommend again. The one open question that I have is... Who is the Mother of Ravens communicating with via her weird image wall that she has in her lair? If you can answer this question, please comment below. If you liked the video, comment below. If I made any dumb mistakes, comment below. And now, people, happy Easter in case you celebrate that. And otherwise, have a great one.